Next up is Nathaniel Fussell, N2NAF, and he's going to talk to us about traveling ionospheric disturbances. So for those of you who aren't disturbed enough yet, here he comes. Hi everyone, how are you? Good, I'm Nathaniel, uh, W2NAF. Um, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Scranton, and I am the leader and main founder of the Ham Radio Sciences and Investigation. And uh, this morning I'm going to talk to you about a study that I've actually been working on for a couple of years, but uh, we finally just got it published uh, in Geophysical Research Letters about two months ago. Um, and I think it's a really neat study because it really shows how, uh, yet another way how space weather affects both the ionosphere and amateur radio communications, HF communications. So the title of this talk is Amateur Radio Communications as a Novel Sensor of Large-Scale Traveling Ionospheric Disturbances. And you know, I, I have a lot of people who are working with me, uh, some of whom are students, some of whom are other professors, some of whom are volunteers in the community. So I, I'd really like to thank all of those people, all of my co-authors. Uh, so as a, a reminder, I think most people here know this, but you never know who's in your audience. Uh, all of our HF communications, the long distance ones, uh, they can travel around the world uh, thanks to the ionosphere. And this is the electrically charged layer of the Earth's upper atmosphere that's generated primarily by solar ultraviolet uh, and X-ray energy hitting the Earth's neutral atmosphere and ionizing particles up there. So you'll knock off electrons from neutral particles and then you get this plasma of uh, free-floating electrons and free-floating positive ions. And so because of atmospheric chemistry and gravity and things like that, you can get this, uh, these layers of the ionosphere that during the day you have the most structure, uh, you have closest to Earth, the D layer, the E layer, the F1 and the F2 layer going from 80 kilometers altitude up to about 300 kilometers altitude. And then at night, the ionosphere doesn't disappear completely, it just uh, reduces as the electrons find their positive ions and turn back into neutral particles. Uh, so at night you get uh, more of just an E layer and an F layer. Uh, so uh, we're used to thinking about our radio signals going up and hitting uh, one of these layers like the F1 or the F2 layer and then refracting back down. Uh, but you can also have influences uh, where you get these uh, periodic or quasi-periodic changes of uh, a wave that goes through the ionosphere. And so that's what you see over here. This is a, a ray trace uh, simulation of uh, the ionosphere. So up here you have the ionosphere. This is from a model called the International Reference Ionosphere. You have a wave uh, in the electron density that's going from the high latitudes down towards the equator. And this is a very typical sort of pattern for this kind of wave. Uh, here in this particular uh, diagram, we're seeing waves that have a wavelength of about um, a few hundred kilometers, maybe. These are medium scale traveling ionospheric disturbances. Now down here, we're looking at a vertical cut of the ionosphere that's going from this point over to this point. And those rays are radio rays that are on 14 megahertz. So we're using the uh, far lap, uh, actually this is not far lap, but we're using a numerical ray tracing program to predict where those rays are going to go. Now you can imagine you have one ham radio transmitter here and you have another ham radio transmitter out there. And what does this uh, station out here hear from this transmitter if you have this wave moving overhead? Well, you can see these rays get focused and defocused by the wave, by these um, waves that are going overhead, these disturbances, and you'll see that it clumps and declumps these rays down on the ground. And so if you're operating HF and you have a traveling atmospheric disturbance going overhead, what this means is that you'll periodically get a stronger signal from this transmitter and then a weaker signal from this transmitter, and that will repeat over and over and over again. So that's a traveling atmospheric disturbance. You might hear it as like QSD or fading um, with you know periods of 15 minutes to even a few hours. So I wanted to know, I, I did my uh, PhD using the SuperDAR network 
um, and I studied these traveling atmospheric disturbances a lot, I wanted to know, can we actually see this in the ham radio data too? So I went to uh, the different global ham radio observation networks, the reverse speaking network, WhisperNet, and PSK recorder, and I was able to download a bunch of their data and I plotted it. And so that's what you see over here. This is data from over the United States from all three RBN, WhisperNet, and PSK recorder networks. This is 12 hours of those observations uh, plotted uh, from 12 universal or Zulu time to 24 uh, UT and going from 500 to 200, 2500 kilometers distance between the transmitters and the receivers. And what you can see, so this is really showing you on 14 megahertz what the typical length distance of a QSO is for this period of time. And you can see this is during the day, daylight hours. This is, you don't just have a straight line here at the bottom. You can see the skip distance, it actually oscillates with time. In fact, I was able to draw a sinusoid uh, on the plot with a two and a half hour um, period to it, and it fit the data very well. So then I said, well, that's my traveling atmospheric disturbance. So now, of course, I needed to go actually confirm it with other data sets and also try to get some idea of where it might actually be coming from. So the first data set I uh, tried to uh, compare it to was the super darn data because I was so used to that from graduate school. And it, the super darn radars actually work very similarly to how our amateur radio HF QSOs work. So this is, um, I used radar from, I used data from the radar in Blackstone, Virginia, which you can see in Google Earth of you here. This is what we call a coherent scatter radar, operates between 8 to 20 megahertz. There's a 16 antenna linear phase array, which you can see here is 750 feet long in the photo. Every transmitter um, puts out between 2 to 800 uh, watts. You can phase it all together, and this thing can measure uh, Doppler shifts, uh, spectral width and signal to noise ratio of the signals that come back. And here is a, another picture of the antennas as side view. So there's the radar hut, and there are, uh, these are twin terminated folded dipole antennas, uh, 16 of them. And so what you can do is you can, here's a field of view of the whole radar, you can electronically steer what azimuth it's looking at. So I looked at uh, straight down the middle of the radar field of view, beam 13, which is highlighted in red here, and you can see that matches up very well with where we have the most coverage from the RBN WhisperNet and PSK reporter data. And lo and behold, if I plot that um, data, from the Blackstone radar, you get the exact same sort of skip distance there. So it's a really nice confirmation that we're seeing the same sort of thing using independent techniques. Uh, so another uh, technique I wanted to look at is something called total electron content, which John Ackerman, NAUR, talked about in his uh, talk at the beginning of the session. So this is a measure of the total number of electrons between uh, a GPS, or global navigation satellite, and uh, on the in space and the receiver on the ground. And if you look at the phase delay between the L1 and the L2 signals, you can actually back out the total number of electrons between the satellite uh, in, the, in space and the receiver on the ground. And you can, there's a network of these GPS receivers located throughout the entire United States and around the world. And there are uh, people like the MIT Haystack Observatory and JPL will aggregate all of this data, run the calculations to co compute the TDC, and then they'll even detrend the background for you. So now you can see you got a product called what we call differential total electron content. So here, zero is your green, that's kind of like the average state, and then you get plus and minus. Well, if you look at uh, the period of time that comes from the same November 3rd, 2017 date I was just showing you, you can actually see the wave structures here um, and here. So there's a wave peaks and there's a trough right in the middle. And I'm actually able to compute um, a wavelength of, of this wave. And if I look at a time series of this data, so here I just took the um, uh, mean or the average of all of the TPC in this box over here, I plotted it uh, as a function of time. I'll show you in a minute that this anti-correlates with uh, the ham radio and super darn data very well. I also took a FFT, fast Fourier transform of, the, of this signal, and I got a peak right at two and a half hour 
two and a half hours, which again matches the sinusoid I plotted earlier. So here's a really nice movie of the whole thing. What you can see is that as the skip distance in the amateur radio data moves closer in, the map's going to turn more red. And that's because as you get more electron density in the ionosphere, higher TPC, uh, you end up getting more refraction, which makes your signal coming closer. And then here, where you have it go out, um, when it goes out in range, you see more blue colors because you get less refraction. So I'll just let the movie play here for a minute. So you should be able to see waves propagating from northeast to southwest and anti-correlating with the amateur radio data. So, uh, one of the things we need to do is we need to be able to take the actual amateur radio data and try to estimate, can we look at just the amateur radio data and see what direction um, the waves are going? And, you know, sure enough, what we can do is we can take the same ham radio data before, but we can split it up into latitudinal slices and just look at the waveform as we go from higher latitudes towards lower latitudes. And so if you look at the maximum, uh, where you have the skip distance maximum here, you can see a phase progression indicative of a southward traveling wave. It's um, when you get down to the bottom here, it does move back a little bit, but it's a very complicated wave field, so um, I think we've captured a coherent wave up here, and then here we might be seeing some other wave structure down here. But more or less, for these uh, four slices, you get a really nice phase progression. If you look at longitudinal slices, you really don't see much phase progression, so it's really indicating that it's moving primarily from the north to the south. So uh, from all of this, uh, we've been able to estimate the large-scale traveling atmospheric disturbances. So large-scale meaning that it has periods of longer than 60 minutes and phase velocities greater than 1,000 uh, kilometers per hour um, and horizontal wavelengths greater than you know, a few hundred kilometers. And so we were able to compute these parameters. Uh, but we wanted to know also where do these things come from. So if you look in the literature, you can find out that large-scale traveling atmospheric disturbances are primarily generated by disturbances that actually start in the auroral zone. So you'll have an auroral event which can send um, particles from space precipitating into the auroral zone. You can get current surges in the auroral atmosphere. You can get dual heating. All of this can launch these things called atmospheric gravity waves, which then couple with traveling atmospheric disturbances and propagate down toward the mid-latitude region. So to look at that, one of the pieces of data we looked at um, were measurements from the Poker Flat Incoherent Scatter Radar. This is a different type of radar than the SuperDarn radars. Uh, incoherent scatter radars, they can measure electron densities, temperatures, uh, ion temperatures and composition, uh, plasma velocity, how fast the ionosphere is moving, and um, it, one of the benefits of an ISR compared to an ionosan is uh, ISRs can measure both the bottom side and the top side of the ionosphere. They can measure above the F2 region peak, which ionosans cannot. Um, so this is a picture of the poker flying coherent scatter radar. It's the same type of radar as Arecibo, which unfortunately collapsed, uh, but hopefully we'll get something back. Uh, the Millstone Hill radar, uh, this one operates between uh, 430 to 450 megahertz. I so think this particular one usually operates between 449 and 450. It's got a 2 megawatt heat power. So these things are big radars. Um, and you can see this, there's no moving parts here. This is also an electronically phased array. So there's all sorts of, there's all little um, individual antenna module units that can be individually uh, phase controlled so you can uh, steer the beam in almost any direction you want, all electronically. It's really quite amazing. So here's measurements from it. Um, this is the Pfizer electron density. 
for context, this is the event I was showing you before. So here's our ham radio data. You can see the oscillation down here. So two to three hours before we start seeing the oscillation, we see an enhancement in the Pfizer electron density and also an enhancement in the joule heating. And the idea is that joule heating is what launches the atmospheric gravity waves. Um, so this is a clear indication of auroral activity a few hours before we start seeing the traveling atmospheric disturbances. Um, also up here I have something plotted called the Supermag Electrojet Index. These are measurements uh, from ground magnetometers in the auroral zone, and so those are showing enhancements in um, auroral electrojet currents also happening at the same time. Uh, so if you were to say that the TIDs that we observed in amateur radio came from down here in the, U in the United States, and you were to say, okay, uh, we'll take the phase velocity we computed and the um, azimuth that we said it was coming from, and we project back uh, over a range of periods to you know, do plus and minus estimates. That suggests that the source region is from here. Over here is Pfizer, and this red box around here, that's the region that um, the, uh, that the auroral electrojet surges occurred using that ground magnetometer data. So you can see that um, the disturbances project right back into the region where we would expect, where, we, where we're actually seeing these auroral disturbances. So this is highly suggestive of this auroral disturbance causing these large-scale traveling atmospheric disturbances that are affecting our amateur radio communications. So, um, our conclusions, we saw a large-scale traveling atmospheric disturbance. Um, we were able to estimate uh, that it had occurred about two and a half hours, wavelength of uh, about 1,680 kilometers, phase velocity between 1,100 to 1,200 kilometers per hour, and is propagating uh, southeast with an azimuth of about 163 degrees. The auroral zone activity uh, occurred about three hours prior to the observations, and that's the likely candidate for the LSTIEs observed on that day. And so these results, they laid the foundation for future use of amateur radio communications observations as a method for the study of LSTIEs. And conversely, as amateur radio operators, if you're seeing this, these behaviors, um, this long-term QSB in your communications over a contest period or something like that, now you have an idea why it might be happening. So these results were published in Geophysical Research Letters just a couple months ago. We actually just got an editor's highlight from HEU uh, about two days ago. So you can uh, read more about that. I have some copies over there if you like. And if you'd like to get more involved in HAMSI, you can go to hamsci.org, click the Join HAMSI button, and you can visit us in uh, booth 5008. And as you can see, I've got three students here, two from the University of Scranton, one from New Jersey Institute of Technology. So we're working really hard to involve youth uh, in amateur radio and promote diversity and, and really make this something. You know, we really work hard to get our uh, volunteers who have a lot of experience from the amateur radio community, Greg and Bill and George, working with um, the young people who are interested in this kind of science and technology. So thank you very much. Uh, that's a great question. They're, uh, they're quite ubiquitous, uh, so we'll see them um, you will see them primarily in the fall and the winter. You see less of them in the summer times, and you can, as is what well, I showed you here today, was pretty typical where it could last like all afternoon. You know, and if you're operating, I mean, the variation is, for this particular kind of disturbance, the variation is two and a half hours, so you may, may not notice it too much unless you look at everything aggregate. But if you're, if you're operating a contest and you're one of those, if you're a Tim Ducky or a W3 LPL, you know, and you're really trying to, you know, look at your scores and look at the behavior of the bands over the long term, this may be something to consider. Yes? So you talk about how the radio Well, that's, that is another good question. It's also something we're working on. So we're doing a statistical study right now. Um, uh, we're, we're doing, we have Bill Engelke and uh, Diego 
uh, Diego, you saw Diego in here. Diego's been working on a project where he's looked at a year's worth of these TID disturbances, and he's uh, created histograms to say, we see more of them on this time, and this time, and this time, uh, as a function of uh, season and year, and he's starting to work on correlating that with the rural activity and with other geophysical indices. And uh, Bill Engelke, he's using a machine learning approach to, again, automatically detect these TIDs in our system and relate it back to these geophysical indices. So the goal by the time we're done with this project is to be able to say, if you have an auroral activity level of this much, of it, like the auroral electrogen index reaches this, or if these conditions are met, you are more likely to have these TIDs. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. Um, so there's a number of things. Um, one of the things that, one of the other big projects that we have right now is, uh, of course, the personal space weather station, which you heard about with um, the Tangerine. Uh, a sister project to the Tangerine falling under the personal space weather station umbrella is something called the Great uh, Receiver. And this is a receiver that's just looking at Doppler shifts of the received WWV signal. And we can see these same sorts of traveling ionosphere disturbances in those measurements as well. So we actually have, a, a, we've already been running grapes now for about two years. So we have some good measurements of that. Uh, Veronica, who's in the picture here, she's working at figuring out how you can take those measurements and uh, figure out which way the TIDs are going and what the wavelength is. She'll be giving a talk in tomorrow afternoon's HAMSI forum. Um, Diego will be as well, uh, and they, so those grapes, those HF Doppler shifts are something that's going to help a lot as well. And when we get the Tangerina SDR up and running, there's going to be another set of measurements we can make with that, that will help as well. Yes? Yes. Um, let's see, probably about 10, I'm guessing. <laughs> so um, we just got this one um, this year. Uh, we have Christina Collins, uh, she's a PhD student uh, working on the Personal Space Weather Station, the great project um, at Case Western. Uh, she just submitted a paper to atmospheric measurement techniques uh, last week. Um, she also published uh, a peer-reviewed article in IEEE uh, GRSL. Uh, John Gibbons, he published the GREEP 1 um, schematics and plans in Hardware X. Uh, I've published um, another um, one about, I've published in Space Weather uh, about solar flares and geomagnetic storms during 2017. I should also say we have a really excellent funding record. Um, I've been able to get, between these projects, over uh, $2.5 million in federal grants to support this research. And that's getting um, shared between multiple institutions, including the University of Scranton, Case Western Reserve University, um, the New Jersey Institute of Technology, uh, uh, Tapper is uh, in Zephyr Engineering, they're part of that effort. And then it also helps when we do have people who are working on these projects, um, if they are, you know, really committed to the project, sometimes if we need them to make measurements, we're actually able to provide the equipment for them rather than having people pay out of their own pocket and are able to fund people to travel to the HAMSI workshop and to other conferences. What's up? Oh, so um, I guess a couple other things. Uh, this weekend we have booth talks. So if you go to hamsi.org, you can uh, read about uh, hamsi activities. Uh, over uh, the hamsi booth is at 5008, but if you go to building four, Volt, building four where uh, Youth on the Air is, there's a, a TV set up in the back. And HAMSI will be giving booth talks throughout the weekend about our activities. We have our forum tomorrow in Forum Room 4 at 2.50 p.m., I believe. Uh, just go to hamsi.org and you can get all of that information. And I think that's it.
don't you have a talk in the at the youth forum at 11? I am I personally giving essentially this exact same talk in the booth at 11 a.m. So yeah. you've pretty much heard it. I might go into a little more detail in that talk. Uh, and uh, if you go to hamsite.org, we just had our hamsite workshop in Huntsville, Alabama this past March. There are video recordings of the whole workshop there. Uh, they're not edited yet, we're working on getting them edited, but you can still watch the raw recordings there. And we're hoping to have the hamsite workshop next March at the University of Scranton. And uh, we're hoping ARDC has just uh, agreed to fund a new ham radio station at Scranton. And so thank you, ARDC. We greatly appreciate it. We are hoping to get that built before the ham site workshop in Scranton. Um, we'll do our best with supply chain shortages and everything else. You never know, but that's the goal. I appreciate your patience as well. All right, thanks, Nathaniel. And I want to point out too, uh, the uh, as well as the Hampside Forum tomorrow in Forum Room Four at two fifty. Today in Forum Room Three, I believe it is the SDR yep. Forum at three fifty-five. And uh, I will be talking a little bit more about uh, Tangerine SDR, and I will be talking with Andrew Sport about Tangerine SDR, two, two different approaches to different perspectives of the same hardware. So, if you're interested in that. And if people can come and actually put their hands on hardware. And if you come to our booth right next to the Tangerine's booth, 5,009, 10, 11, in building five, and you can see boards and put your hands on them and make sure it burn parts out and go static and things like that. So. <laughs> No static straps. Anyway, thank you very much. That uh, concludes the uh, TAMPA Forum for our animation today. So thanks for coming by, and we'll look forward to seeing you all next weekend, or I mean next year, or at the booth this weekend.